I wasn't living in New York when I first saw graffiti in New York. I was a visitor and I saw tags on the trains and on the walls in the early 70s and I was curious and intrigued by it just with the thought that well it's it's adolescent rebellion and uh, I was curious as to how it was done, where and why. And, um, it was only several years later when by then I was living in New York and I was watching the artwork evolve from just tags on the train to pieces and to real artworks and they were called even at that time masterpieces. Still my curiosity was was huge by then. I said who are these kids who are doing this and and what does it mean? It was only years later when I actually started to meet graffiti writers and after I had taken a lot of pictures of it um, did I understand from their point of view that it was a voice and more than just fun, which it began as just fun, but they began to understand it as, as a voice and as a statement that they were somebody in this city, that they actually mattered in this city, large anonymous city, they actually mattered and they began to think in terms of who owned public space you know and why should it be only the advertisers who owned public space and who bought it for money these people were citizens and they understood themselves to be citizens and they said well this is my wall and uh, or my train and I'm going to put my name up on it so um, I think my interest increased over the years when I began to understand these things better. I think anybody making a document, whether it's a photo document or, or even more so with a film documentary, um, the biggest problem that you face is one of access. How do, you, um, how do you get people to trust you and to be part of your project and to agree to be part of the project? And what happened for me was that it, it grew organically. I wasn't a journalist, I wasn't an anthropologist, I was an artist and I was working on my own art, which was sculpture at the time in New York City. And this was fun for me. I was running around on the station platforms waiting for trains, watching for a good piece to come in and trying to grab it with my camera. Um, I didn't know any graffiti writers at this, at this time and I wasn't thinking in terms of well maybe I'm going to make a film or maybe I'm going to make a book. None of that. It was just fun. So actually the writers saw me before I saw them because they would ride the trains, they would take pictures of their work, they would see me and they'd say hey who do you think that guy is? What's he doing? Maybe he's a cop because I was, you know, I was older. I was twice as old as they were. And, uh, you know, I looked, frankly, like an undercover cop. <laughs> so they were suspicious and nobody wanted to approach me. Till finally one day somebody did. One of the writers was taking pictures and he came up to me and, and he said, so what are you doing? And I showed him my pictures and he said, hey, these are really good. Actually, my cousin did that one. And uh, he said, if you want to meet some graffiti writers, go to 149th Street after school hours. Uh, and there's what we call the writer's bench at, the, uh, at that station. And you'll probably find some writers there and you can meet them. So I did. And they're exactly as he said. There were a whole bunch of, of uh, basically teenagers fresh out of school in the afternoon sharing black books, talking about their sketches, um, watching trains go by. So I showed them my photographs at that time and they began to say, well, uh, maybe he's legit, maybe he's okay. And I opened my studio doors downtown. I said, I've got a whole bunch of photo albums there and if you want to come and see them, feel welcome to come. And so they began to assemble at my studio in lower Manhattan by the time we started to make a book, Martha and I, and by the time Tony and I started to make the film, I knew everybody, they knew that I wasn't a cop, they knew that um, you know, this was probably a good project to be involved with, so it was easy. The, uh, access, the access problem was dealt with because of the organic way in which I went about it.
it was way easier for me at that time because there weren't so many people trying to do it. There was no comp, basically. It was me and uh, also from a completely different quarter, Martha began to take pictures of, you know, in the, in the 70s also. Um, and that's about it in New York City. A couple of the graffiti writers were taking pictures, but they weren't of very high quality because they were using little, you know, cameras with, with very low quality film. Um, so, yeah, I wouldn't want to try to do something now with the social media and with a whole bunch of people who already knew about it and who were doing something as well. The competition would have been fierce. And one of the one of the joys for me of doing it was that I was I was unique, and so I didn't feel any pressure. So I was going up just for fun on the platforms and taking pictures. I could spend all morning long and wait, and I didn't have the fear. Oh, somebody's going to get it before me, because uh, you know there was none of that, no social media. In fact, what's interesting about the trains is, is that it kind of is a a predecessor to social media because it was a network of 600 miles of subway traffic with uh, maybe three and a half million people each day who were riding the trains and who would see the work. So it was like a gigantic network going around the city. And writers, because they, they always say that it wasn't for the general public what they were doing, it was for other kids, for their peers. They didn't care what the general public thought but they did care what their peers thought. And their peers grew from just the neighborhood, the local group of kids that knew each other, to a whole city network of people who did not know each other because they were far apart, but they knew the work. And so that was really fascinating and interesting to the artists. And eventually, when they began to meet each other, when art galleries and that sort of, you know, the art world began to get, take interest in them, they would meet each other and say, yeah, you know, I saw your work, you know, yeah, you, and so then they would, they would already admire and respect a person that they just met <laughs> based on the artwork that they saw. I think in 1980, I met Martha because uh, the graffiti writers knew her and they knew me and they said, hey, you know, there's somebody else out there doing what you're doing. And they introduced us. Uh, and Martha and I at first were, were somewhat competitive with each other, like because at that time, by 1980, and their art galleries were taking, bringing artists in, and the art world was taking interest in graffiti. Um, the idea that, yeah, maybe we could do a book became a possibility. And at first, Martha and I tried to do our own book separately, and we were competitive. And uh, because the New York publishing world was not interested in doing a, a graffiti book, we discovered, we decided to work on it ourselves and do a project that included both our work, which we felt was complementary because of Martha's, Martha's uh, profession was photography and mine was art. And it was a good combination putting the two together. We still couldn't get our book published in the United States because everybody said, ooh, graffiti, no, 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 no. It took us going to the Frankfurt Book Fair <clears throat> in 1982 with our book that we had made a model and showing it to publishers there and Thames and Hudson agreed to publish it. So that's what it took. So here we are many years later. Uh, by 1987, there was an article in the New York Times that the most Actually, it said the second most stolen book in London was Spray Can Art, which was the second book I did. And, that, and the article said, after the first most stolen book in London, which is Subway Art. So that was, that was an interesting article and an indication of the, the popularity of the book. Um, it has since kind of been the, the, uh, the trainer, let's say, for generations of artists of kids outside of New York City, outside of the United States, who learned from it the, uh, the technique and the culture of graffiti. And it's had a big role in spreading it all around the world. And so now, here we are uh, at this juncture.
what appeals to me most about it is that it has touched people in a very powerful way about um, giving a voice to, to people who don't otherwise have a voice and about giving a certain amount of power to people to claim their place in the world and their place as members of the human race and as members of, of culture to be able to, to display their artwork in a public way without having to go through and that's, that's not to say it's easier but without having to go through the normal process in society of speaking, of having a voice which is if you don't have a university education let's say or you don't have a profession in the media or something like that you don't have a voice people are taking it upon themselves to take this opportunity to speak out and to claim their role in society and that's been the thing that has most impressed me about the the diffusion of this art around the world and I think that's where we are now.